Hi everyone, welcome to INACOL's Teacher Talk webinar on Thursday, September 19th, 2013. Our topic today is Becoming a Blended Learning Teacher, the Changing Role of the Classroom Educator. And our guests today are Mitch Conrad from Jeffco Virtual Academy in Colorado, Becky Thompson from the Youth Connections Charter School in Chicago, and Linda Goodwin, the Chief Education Officer of the Youth Connections Charter School in Chicago as well. Our, our focus of this webinar really is about how is teaching blended different than teaching face-to-face, -face, which strategies and tools are different and how some are the same, and then finally how education through blended learning processes can cause a more personalized approach for students. Our webinar format is we'll do some introductions here in just a few minutes. Um, we've got some questions that I'll pose to the panelists and then they'll answer and have a little discussion about. And as we, as we are going along, if you've got other questions or follow-up questions, please type them in the chat room and then we can follow up that way as well. Okay, and I'm look, suddenly looking at the chat room. Sorry, I was distracted for a minute. All right, so let's just give a little quick background for blended learning. So most of us use the definition of Horn and Staker that blended learning is a formal education program in which a student learns at, part, at least in part through online delivery of content with some student control over time, place, and path, and partly at a school uh, using a variety of tools. So that's the blended learning definition that we work with. It's important to note that when we talk about blended learning is not the same as tech rich. A technology rich environment is good, but it's not the same as blended learning. Just because a student is on a computer or a teacher is on a digital whiteboard does not equal blended learning. It's important to realize that regardless of what kind of teaching and learning we're talking about, whether face-to-face, -face, whether blended, whether online, there's these three important elements as part of that process, right? That it's about what the student is doing and where the student is, what the teacher is doing and where the teacher is, and then finally, what and where the content is as well. And with that, I'd like to introduce you to our first speaker, Mitch Conrad of Jefferson County, who will tell you a little bit about himself and what he does. Okay, my name is Mitch Conrad. Um, I teach at Ralston Valley High School and also at the Jeffco Virtual Academy. Um, I teach math, computer science, and a digital video uh, class. I'm also the head boys basketball coach uh, at Ralston Valley High School. Um, I've been teaching for 24 years. And kind of the way that I got into it was I had a friend of mine uh, kind of connected with this virtual academy, and that's all online teaching. And I got thinking after I was doing that, I was actually teaching calculus and got thinking that I could use this pretty easily with some of my computer science classes. And so then I started blending that. I talked to my administration, and they uh, they agreed to allow me to not have the, the students attend my class every single day. We had certain online days where they could do the curriculum uh, on their own. And that worked out pretty well. Um, but I've been teaching for 24 years and just, uh, I guess, about not even one full year of blended teaching at this point. Um, now I'm also teaching my computer science classes online through the virtual academy. I have an AP computer science class. So I teach that here at the local high school and then also online. And I teach a beginning programmer class. I have two classes at Ralston Valley High School, and I do one class through the virtual academy online as well. So the classes I do at Ralston Valley uh, for my computer science now, um, I would consider the blended environment. I don't, uh, <clears throat> I don't have any formal training uh, in any of this. Uh, it's kind of been just... Uh, um, learning on the go and talking to some other teachers doing the online and I just blend it with uh, what I do in my classroom. So Mitch, somebody asked if you were the virtual basketball coach. <laughs> uh, 
No, I haven't figured out how to do that. Um, although we do a lot of work uh, over the internet, but uh, I don't think that qualifies as blended learning. Great. And our, our next uh, panel member is Becky Thompson from Chicago. And Becky, are you there? So I apologize for this audio problems. Um, I've got to help figure out, I thought Becky was connected, but I guess she's not. So um, I'm going to pause the recording and help get Becky connected here somehow. And Becky Thompson is our other panelist. Becky, go ahead. Uh, yes, I uh, work in Chicago at the Youth Connections Charter School, and I'm getting feedback, so this is the second. Let me turn down my own speaker, so I'm not getting. Okay, can everyone hear me? No. Okay. Yeah, Becky, you're sounding fine. Go ahead. Okay, so the Youth Connection Charter School is a, is a uh, dropout charter in Chicago, and uh, we actually, uh, the charter includes 20, 20 campuses across the city, so we have small, um, small uh, schools, and about 150 to 250 students, and um, uh, model development coordinator, the definition of that title basically is, is that I'm in charge of uh, creating the model. And our model is uh, 3 plus 1, which is basically taking a curriculum and adding components of either applications and higher level uh, projects and, and uh, performance-based activities or act, um, interventions. So the three pieces are curriculum, what we call applications, and then uh, the third piece is our interventions, because a lot of our students come in with uh, learning gaps. And so that's essentially where we chose last year to incorporate the blended. And so we have a standard curriculum, and then depending on the student and their individual needs, we either add interventions to bring them up to level, or enhance their curriculum with um, activities and projects above and beyond that. And what got you going in this direction? Uh, basically, I, I, um, I've been teaching for about 40 years. <laughs> and so um, over the last, uh, at one point, I was in Dallas, Texas at a private school. And we did a lot of individual kinds of learning and a lot of activity-based learning. And so over the years, obviously, that is something that you can do much better on a, with a computer. And so that was how I got interested in, and um, began somewhat leading the, the model at Youth Connection. Do you want to talk a little bit about your model and the, the blended model that you guys use at the Youth Connections Charter School? Well, it's basically what I said, which is the three, the three it's called 3 plus 1. The three pieces are the curriculum, which is the interventions, the, I'm sorry, we start with the curriculum, add interventions, or add enhanced learning projects and, and that kind of thing. The plus one is actually the college readiness, where we're doing uh, a practice compass, which is our entrance uh, test to get into our Chicago city school or city colleges. And so um, um, I guess we started moving toward technology over the last few years and have wanted to, to um, include more of that in, in the curriculum. 
getting a lot of feedback, Great, thank so it's you. hard for me to stay focused. Yeah, I'm, we're not hearing the feedback that much here, so you're doing fine. Um, okay. And and then it did was Linda able to join us? I thought she said the last yeah. I spoke with her, she said she'd be here, but I I'm not seeing that she's on. All right, so I think we'll just move on to our questions then, and if she joins in, she can join in a little bit later. So, uh, Mitch, for you and, and Becky, the, the first question really has to do is, what caused you to become a blended learning teacher? I heard both of you talk about how you, you're both pretty experienced teachers, so it'd be interesting to hear your perspective on what caused you to move into becoming a blended learning teacher, and now that you're involved in that direction, how you've seen your teaching change because of that. I guess I'll start then. Um, I, I first got involved with the just the pure online teaching, and I'm still involved with that. And uh, my my thought was just to bring that into my regular classroom, and um, I, I like the freedom that it brings the kids. Uh, I think that's one of the things that they really appreciate. The ones that can handle it, um, they can do their lessons whenever it fits their schedule. I think that's a real plus in their eyes. Um, I have noticed that the kids who are in like my early classes in the morning, uh, they they tend to appreciate it even more because uh, then they can do their, most of them like to do their work in the evenings at home. And as long as they're understanding things, um, they're able to, uh, to uh, skip the class that actually where I will go through some of those things in the lesson. So mostly just from the online and then wanting to bring the advantages of that into my classroom. When you say and skip class, what exactly does... Okay. Go ahead, Becky. Sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to add to that. To, uh, we did have an online curriculum, and so what we were doing was wanting to augment and, as I said, the intervention to bring students up to being able to do it at that level. And since we have such a wide array of students in our 20 campuses, you know, it was something that was really flexible that we could focus in on individual students' needs. Could each of you talk a little bit about the course management system that you use and how the contents put together and that sort of thing in general terms for each one of your schools? And Becky, why don't I let you follow up with that first, and then we'll switch to Mitch. Well, as I said, we have 20 schools, and so that it's very general. Our online uh, curriculum provider actually gives us Blackboard, so that we're working through Blackboard and then um, What's happening in each campus is, is is the actual identification of the individual needs and or the um, enhancements for for the uh, specific uh, needs of the students. I'm not sure that answered it. Did it? So Becky, it sounds like what you're saying is that the teachers uh, develop the content to personalize the learning for the student. Is that what I hear you saying? Yes, at this level so far, this is just our second year somewhat attempting to do that, and and I oversee and, and help them and, and and make sure that they're, you know, incorporating a lot of different things, but essentially that's it. The teachers are somewhat um, involved in creating the additional curriculum above and beyond what's online, and that's um, really based on individual student needs. Great, and then Mitch, do you want to respond to that? And then uh, Bruce had a question for you in the chat room if you want to look at that and respond to that as well. So Mitch, uh, you may need to click, click on the talk button. So if you were saying something, we didn't hear it. So the question he was asking was, how do you decide which elements of the online course you use in the blended environment? And then we're kind of curious about the course management system and the content that you use. So go ahead and click on the talk button and share that with us. 
Okay, I thought I clicked it. Now I think I'm on. <laughs> um, the course management system that we use in our district is Schoology. We just switched to Schoology a year ago. And actually, that's about the time that I was uh, starting with the online learning and then going to the blended. So it's, uh, it's very, uh, very easy for the kids to use. They have no trouble. It's kind of like Facebook to them. Um, you have messages on the side. In fact, that's how I make comments on their uh, work. I can, I can put little comments and send it back to them. Uh, they can message me. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty, pretty good interactive type of uh, system that way. Good evening. Hello. Hello. Yes, this is Dr. Bush from you there? Chicago, used to next to charter school. How are you? Hello. Good. Rob, did you want to jump in here? Hi. Linda, this is Rob Darrow. We're glad that you could join us. Um, Mitch was just sharing a little bit about his course management system and that sort of thing. So let me let him finish and oh, then have okay. you talk a little bit about uh, your school. Um, so okay, cool. <laughs> and so. Um, Bruce, I mean, <laughs> Mitch, Bruce asked this question, how do you decide which elements of the online course you use in the blended learning environment? So if you could answer that, then we'll switch over to Linda and hear a little bit about her role in her school and, and how that works for her. All right, sure thing. Um, I, uh, I put everything online for my computer science classes. Uh, so I have kids that If, uh, if they're doing fine, they on, I only have them show up to class uh, on test days. Um, I also put in some standards for that, and I found that to be a real motivator. Um, I have that they have to maintain an 80% average in the class in order to uh, have the option to not attend class and do it themselves online. I also have a rule that they can have no missing or incomplete assignments. If they have anything missing or incomplete, they are required to come to class. And I also have a parent uh, permission form that has to be signed, and the parents have to agree to those terms. And the parent at any time can uh, tell them they, you know, and drop that. And uh, I also have the right to drop that as well. So they can lose the privilege of the online piece. Uh, but so I put everything online, and then uh, for the kids in class, I think the real advantage for that that I see is is the kids that really don't need my help very much, aren't there very often, and I get to spend more time with the kids that really need that help, and we don't have other distractions around us, and I can really uh, focus on them. Great. Thanks, Mitch. Uh, Linda, welcome. We're glad you could join us. Would you like to share a little bit about what caused your school well, first of all, if you'd introduce yourself and share a little bit about yourself, and then talk about what caused your school to move into the blended learning direction. Um, okay. Um, I am Dr. Goodwin. I'm the Chief Education Officer at Youth Connection Charter School in Chicago. So I'm not in the classroom, but we do have several of our campuses under our charter using uh, blended learning. And we moved toward a blended learning model because we had such um, a variety of um, uh, levels coming into our, into, our, into our schools. Our kids were coming in in advanced level, some at remedial level, some at inter intermediate level. And so we had to come up with a model that, that kind of differentiated. And this allowed us to differentiate across our classroom. That was one of the reasons we moved to a blended learning model. And we were looking at uh, because our, we, we deal with a very at-risk population, and it's a very uh, a much older population, ages 17 to 21, um, we, we were looking at accelerating learning in terms of time for a, a group of students. They, you know, they would run out of time in terms of being able to get their high school diploma. So online learning and blended learning was a, uh, was a, a solution for us. Great, thank you. 
I'm going to um, shift to the chat room for a minute. So this is a question for, for all of our panelists. Um, maybe, uh, Dr. Goodwin, maybe you could answer this question, and, and then Mitch, perhaps you could as well. Um, so how do you do attendance? So like Mitch was just talking about how he's got students that just show up on test days. So Mitch, I'm guess, guessing that that means that they would could skip your class for a week and then just show up the, the following week. So. How, how do you guys handle attendance with that? And then I'd ask the same question of, the, of uh, Dr. Goodwin of your school as well. How do you do attendance? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Mitch, you want to you want to go first? Well, attendance can be kind of tricky uh, for me to keep sure. Attendance is a little tricky to take because uh, I have to check quite a few of those things on the checklist. Um, first thing, you know, I see who's there and who's not there, and then I check their grades and check real quickly to see if they have any missing assignments. So as long as uh, as long as they've got everything taken care of, uh, then I don't mark them absent, and their parents are aware of that. Okay, our situation is a little different because we had uh, brick and mortar, so all of our kids must attend class. So, I mean, even though it's a blended learning environment, they have to attend class um, on a daily basis. Or, you know, depending on the teacher, depending on the student, some of them may be given an opportunity to attend maybe three days a week or two days a week, but there is a definite face-to-face uh, -face interaction on a consistent basis. Great, thank you. Um, so there's two related questions here that I'm going to combine. Um, the one question asks about diagnostic tests that you use for the needs of the students, and then the other question uh, relates to that in the sense that do you, what kind of ongoing assessment data do you use on a daily basis to group students or to change how you meet the needs of students? So the question really is, what assessments do you use on a daily basis as teachers to modify the curriculum for the students? And then if you do that, how do you do that? Um, well, we use, in, uh, within our schools, within our charter, we use the STAR assessment. And we use it for progress monitoring, and we also use it as a growth measure. And so once a student is tested, we are able to pull those instructional planning reports, and they are diagnostic. And so we can, we, we can determine what skills um, students are lacking or where we need to focus um, in terms of putting kids in a tiered intervention. And, and we, use that as a, we use that tool as a basis for identifying those, those interventions for students both at a low level as well as a high level. And we also use those um, assessments within A plus, which is um, which is part of the Aventa system, and we use that across our school. So we use both of those tools as diagnostics. And I can't I can't speak from the teacher's perspective in terms of the daily assessments because I'm not I'm not in the classroom. But as an administrator, we require that they move that they use those assessments across the network to progress monitor and also identify students needing urgent or 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 some type of uh, Remedial intervention. Great, Mitch. How about you? Well, I don't really have a diagnostic uh, type test. However, um, I have daily assignments that they turn in. They submit them online. Uh, so even if they're in my class, I still have them submit everything online uh, through Schoology. Uh, all the assignments are posted there. Um, I give them a timeline. So they know exactly what they need to get done. And basically, the kids that are in my class either want to be there uh, or are already there and wanted to get a little help, or they, they're missing something and they need my help. So um, I'm, I'm basically working with the kids um, that maybe aren't able to get things figured out all on their own. So it sounds like on a daily basis, you're checking their completion data to make sure the work is being completed. And then kind of a follow-up question to that, you talk about the students in your class and the students not in your class. I'm curious on a daily basis about how many students show up in your class 
that you're working with directly versus the students that stay home and work on it online? You know, it, it really varies day to day and I think part of it is based upon just the difficulty of the lesson. Um, I would say on average probably about a third of my students uh, do the lesson on their own time and about two thirds in class, but that will fluctuate uh, fairly often. Um, the tests, I could even do those online, but I like having that little check-in point and, and reviewing with them before we take the test. And, and that way I kind of know what they look like too because some of them are some of them are really sharp and don't need much help and uh, so at least I get a chance to touch base with them and, um, but anywhere from a third to a half I would say on a general normal day. So it sounds like then the students that do show up um, since it's a smaller number that you're able to individualize even more than you could with the whole class and then yeah. in addition to that, Catherine asked a question in the chat room about um, do they attend your class, do the students who attend your class as blended also attend face-to-face -face classes the rest of the day and then do you teach them at the beginning or the end of the day or is it any time during the day? Kind of what's the structure look like? Well, it varies. Uh, I do three different classes as blended. So I've got some in the morning and some in the afternoon. Um, and we're kind of a, we do a modified block schedule. So some days it's traditional four, uh, 55 minute classes and other days it's blocks. So it really depends upon the day, um, what time of the day I would see them. But um, the rest of the classes that my students take are your face to face normal classes. So they kind of look at this, I think the online piece is being a privilege and that's kind of the way I treat it, that it's a privilege to uh, as long as you can handle the responsibility and that's kind of the way I word it with them, if you can handle the responsibility of, of your own learning and uh, as long as you don't have any questions um, or you need help, uh, then you get the privilege of not having to um, be seated in the class to do the work. Great. So here, here's a question really for, for everybody. Um, I'll ask this question. Do you have students who are part-time and full-time in your schools or are they all full-time? So Dr. Goodwin, why don't you start with that one and then Mitch, you can follow up with that and then I'll go on to the next question. Mm -hmm. Okay, because we have, um, within our charter, we have 20 different school models. We do have a, a couple of school models where students only uh, attend maybe three hours a day, which is part time. But then we also have school models where they attend all day and pretty much take a regular school schedule with maybe one or two online classes within within their school day. So it, it, it really varies. We offer uh, a couple options for students. We do have kids who work and so they come in the morning and then they work in the evening or we have kids who work in the evening and they come in the morning. So it, it really varies for us. But however, we do use on the um, online learning piece for for our teen moms sometimes and for those students are, who are homebound for whatever reason and we have a, a way in which we can track their progress and their attendance. So it, it really varies and I mean that's one of the beauties of, a, um, of blended learning and online instruction. You know, it can be accessed anytime, anywhere. Okay, the students at my high school are, uh, I would say they're all full-time students. This is a traditional public school. Um, you know, school goes from 7.30 in the morning till 3 in the afternoon. Um, but by having the blended, they actually have the option of extending the day to whatever time they want. Um, so we don't have any part-time students. About the only part-time would be as if uh, there are some students that take classes through the online academy, like for example in our mathematics area, um, we'll have kids go all the way through calculus before they're seniors 
And so they can take like differential equations through the online academy. In fact, I'm a proctor for seven students here at my school that are taking um, an online math class that uh, through another teacher in the district. And so, but for the most part, all our students are full-time ones here. Great. So I'd like to move on to the second kind of big question that we, we've talked about a little bit. Um, so some educational experts are suggesting that every teacher will eventually become a blended learning teacher. Would you say this is true or not, or what do you think? And Becky, what if we start with you, and then we'll shift to Mitch, and then Dr. Goodwin, you can kind of summarize at the end and see what you think. Okay. Um, I, I feel like, yes, I, I do, because I think there's so much potential of the Internet and all of the um, possibility of projects and research and, and that kind of um, learning for students, plus things like Khan Academy, where you're um, thinking about how students learn and how they might learn differently for a different subject or something, and, and you have the alternatives right there that you can send them off to do Khan Academy, and they're suddenly getting things that maybe you, even in a face-to-face, -face were able to do. So I think it will be kind of a combination of face-to-face -face and, and um, internet and online, online curriculum. Okay, I think I'm on now. Um, I would I would tend to agree with that. I, I I think there's a lot of advantages to this. The flexibility alone for students. Um, for instance, I have a student right now that actually has just left for surgery, had to fly out to the East Coast for some special surgery, and he's going to be gone for a month and a half. And situations like that, our district would you know get. Uh, we would, they would line up like a homebound tutor to help them with their classes and things until he can get back to class. Well, um, now, we, since we have the virtual academy going and I have my blended class, there's no, no real accommodations needed for, for this uh, particular student because he can do the work when he's feeling up to it. There's some days that, you know, he's feeling tough after the surgery. But then there's other days he might be up in the middle of the night because he's been sleeping and he can get some work done. So um, I, I do kind of agree that I think things are headed towards the blended. Um, one thing is kind of interesting, uh, since I'm a high school basketball coach, I've heard some talk about this in, in those circles that um, the, the you know Division One athletics might be kind of on their way out because Colleges are going to be less brick and mortar, and and not have the, you know, the all the facilities and things that uh, are going to go more to the online. So there's going to be some kind of transition in that area as well. Mm hmm Yeah, absolutely. And I would certainly agree with you, uh, Mitch. And just on a from a personal perspective, I have a son who is a baseball player. Um, at Virginia State, and when they're traveling, I mean, all, they take courses online. Everything is done online, so I would certainly agree with that. Um, and I think to sum it up and, and trying to connect the pieces, I think every teacher will experience some type of online uh, learning uh, or teaching an online learning platform at some point, specifically as we move towards the 21st century learning skills. Um, you know, there, there, there are more and more uh, uh, opportunities for students to become globally co connected and participate in other learning activities or experiences outside of their local school. So I would certainly say at some point each teacher will experience blended learning or online learning at some point in their career. Great. And Dr. Goodwin, uh, Chris, uh, who's on our webinar here asked this, this question of you. He, he asked if at your school, is your approach mastery based? Are students able to move faster or slower through the content? And if so, how is that monitored and uh, monitored by your teachers? 
<laughs> you know what? And Becky is on the line. Becky and I are both work at the, at the, for the same organization, and she really has a hands-on. Um, she really has hands-on experience with those teachers. So, Becky, if you can chime in as I respond. Okay. Okay. Um, well, to, to 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 address your question, I think that our teachers are um, experiencing this at different levels. And so some of some of our teachers are allowing kids to move at their move at their own pace and kids are finishing faster. And some of them are walking them through the course. So I really think it depends on our teachers, but we certainly experience um, a variety of our teachers are experiencing online learning in a variety of ways. And and so and so are the students who are enrolled in those courses. So some of them are using it, and, and yes, those kids are going at a very rapid pace, and they're earning their credits, they're finishing their courses, and they're you know getting out of high school at a faster rate. But others are not moving as, as quickly. Um, I really think it depends on the teacher and how the teacher has structured his or her classroom or her learning environment. I don't know, Becky, if you want to kind of chime in. You've, you've had a little more experience in those classrooms than I have. Well, and I agree 100%. And one of the ways that we're also trying to, to think about that is, is more of a competency-based kind of uh, way of, of saying that they have competency in this, let's move them on. And, and so that it isn't, it's not about seat time. We're really debating the issues around seat time uh, at our campuses and, and whether they have to sit there for X amount of minutes in order for it to be counted as a credit, or is it about uh, mastery of skills, mastery of content, and then moving on at their own pace. And I think um, that's one of the things uh, that we're exploring in our second year now to see how would that play out a little bit differently. Again, that's because we have a lot of students, as Linda had mentioned before, who are 18, 19, 20, you know, and we don't want them to age out. We want them to complete, and yet for whatever reasons, they might have dropped out and been out of school for a year or two, and so now they're really kind of focused on doing things quickly, and we want to give that, them that advantage that they could move through um, the content more quickly than having to sit there for the seat time. Thank you. That's great. I, um, there's been some exciting conversation in the chat room, so I think I'm going to shift over to that for just a second to kind of uh, bring everybody in this conversation together. So Bruce talked about how at his school, and Bruce, I'm not sure where you work, but he talked about how at their school they're offering English 11 and government as blended sections because they have a state requirement for online teaching to, for students to take that. I'd be interested in knowing which state that is. And Catherine talks about they have rolling enrollment at her school where students can enroll at, at most any time. And then there was some conversation about LMS platforms and that sort of thing. But I thought those other statements were pretty interesting. And Bruce, um, I'm curious what state you're in. So, oh, so that's Green Bay area. and. Versus, oh, Virginia Beach, Virginia, great. OK. So it's interesting okay. to see how policy decisions at our state level have influenced this direction of blended learning as well. So that's what I was trying to bring mm -hmm. in. So great conversation in the chat room. Um, let's shift over here for a minute to talk a little bit about what the characteristics of, of being a blended learning teacher. And uh, Mitch, let's, why don't we start with you and then uh, we'll move to Becky, and then Dr. Goodwin, you can kind of summarize at the end as well from your uh, observations of, of what are the characteristics that make a good blended learning teacher? You know, I guess there again, I, I don't feel like I'm an expert. Um, you know, I'm just, I, I think you've got to be, you know, not afraid to try something um, and then be willing to go back and fix and improve. Um, you know, since I have no formal education in this at all, it's more just I'm feeling my way through it, and every time I, I think uh, I'm learning every time to do a better job. So, okay. 
And I guess it's Becky. And so I, I'm guessing that, you know, as I'm working with teachers, I'm noticing that the more flexible teachers are the best teachers that are a little bit more flexible. And they're adaptable. They're, they're thinking about new ideas and allowing their students to move forward and, and, and think about education in a different way. Um, had another thought. Um, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Linda. <laughs> okay, I think I think the transition from being a teacher to a facilitator is very important. And so That's it. Um, teachers, teachers are managing their, their classroom in a, in a totally different way, and they're allowing students to make more choices and be more, more responsible for what they are learning, not necessarily what teachers are teaching, but what students are, are learning. Um, I think they are more of a, a, a guide, a coach, uh, a facilitator. And they are they are now a teacher who is is privy to just in time learning, you know. So sometimes the lesson plan may not be it because this student needs a skill like right now, and and so the teacher has to be able to shift to meet the needs of the learner at, at on a moment's notice. And I, I think that's a huge shift in teaching. I think another huge. Uh, shift or characteristic that a, a teacher should should have is being able to plan for individual students as opposed to the whole classroom. And I, and I think that's a, that's one of the, that's a, that's a big paradigm shift, I think, for teaching. And I hope I was able to kind of sum that up when we talk, as we speak about characteristics, but we also have to talk about the paradigm shift that, that's happening in, in education and pedagogy and so forth. Great. Um, back here, Dr. Goodwin, a uh, couple of people have asked this question in a different way, so let me just ask it back to you. Um, the, I, I heard you mention event to learning. The, the question really is, are your teachers creating their own content, or are they using content? I heard you mention A plus and event, are they using content from there? Where's the content coming for the blended courses that are being taught is really the question. Uh, the content, the content is coming, and we do use Aventa across our school. So we use Aventa in terms of credit recovery. We use the core curriculum, and we also use the A plus module for remediation and college readiness. So the the curriculum is existing. Um, it's existing curriculum that they're working with. They're not making up their own curriculum right now. However, they may be including. Uh, yeah including curricula from other places, such as Khan Academy or some other online venues. And a lot of the extended uh, learning that they're doing, the project-based and that kind of thing, is, is uh, coming from the teacher to move beyond just you know the the coverage that you have, and they're they're doing projects and that kind of thing that that extend that learning, and that does tend at least at Youth Connection to be coming from uh, the individual uh, teachers. Great, that's uh, this is a great conversation. So the, the the other big question in lots of people's minds is so when a school administrator observes in a traditional classroom. You know, most cases I see a teacher standing in front of a classroom providing a lesson to students. Students generally are sitting in groups or rows of desks. What should a school administrator observe in or look for in a blended learning classroom? What would be some of the things that they should be looking for? And Mitch, I, actually, let, let me start with Dr. Goodwin on that one first, and then let's go the other way. We'll look, we'll shift over to Mitch and then back to Becky. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think an administrator should be looking for more of a, a flexible type of classroom setting where you have, you know, you may have a group of students here working on a project, you may have a group of students working online, you may have a group of students who are working in a tutorial type situation. So they're looking at more of a flex model as a, in, in, a, in a blended learning classroom as opposed to row to row, seat to seat. So it's, um, you know, it's, uh, it's it's really a planned environment where groups of students are working on different things. You may even see that students are working on different courses. So in, in a blended environment, you could have, in an English class, you can certainly have students working in 
senior English, junior English, sophomore English, and so forth. So I think the, the, the classroom environment is now a very flexible one. So you're not looking at the traditional uh, classroom setup. So Mitch, if your administrator comes in and observes your computer science class and there's only, I don't know, 10 students in that classroom and 20 of them are at home, how, you know, how does, how does that administrator know that those students are still learning? You know, what are they seeing? What's the evidence that shows that they're still learning in, in that kind of environment? Well, I guess the only evidence they would have for my students that are doing their work at home is that they access my online gradebook, um, and they do have the access to do that, so they can see um, what grades are entered for each one of my students. But probably the biggest, the biggest difference, and it was kind of stated before, was in the classroom, you're not going to see me up in front of the classroom um, leading a lecture. Um, the only time I do that is if I'm going around the room and they're all having some problems with the same situation, then I'll, I'll kind of say, hey, everybody, let's, let's, uh, let me explain this part to you. And I think that's the flexibility. When they need that, that extra, then that is there. But if they don't need it, just one-on-one -on -one help. So it, it meets their needs, whatever they need. And Becky, what, what would you say? How you know when? And uh, the point that I had lost. Go ahead, go ahead, keep yeah. going. The point that I I had kind of left that had kind of dropped out of my mind was, and and Linda kind of mentioned it was, but about a bit being a facilitator and being able to facilitate learning all all around the room, even though students are do, working on different projects or working on interventions or working on. Uh, you know, core curriculum, whatever it is that they're working on. And so, uh, to me, uh, uh, instructor would need to be very creative, motivating the students to keep going, and not necessarily a, a little bit, we struggle sometimes with those students, or excuse me, those teachers thinking that they need to be tutors. Let me just tutor that information. We're trying to move them away from being tutors and having them be more motivators. And and so if a administrator, if I walk into the classroom, I, I'm looking for not only the the teacher to student um, uh, interactions, but also student to student. Now students should be able to share, they should be able to work on projects together and then back to the computer to, to research or something. And, and the other thing I think around the instructor has to do with looking at data and making sure students are, you know, so that facilitator, you know, data management person is, is you know, looking very different than standing in front of that classroom and, and our administrators that's, that seems to be the focus that we need to have them see is that you're no longer going to have that and there might be a lot of noise in the classroom or, or something like that. But if, if students are learning, then it's, it's still very positive. Yeah, so you, it's interesting. So all of you talked about how um, administrators are having to shift into a different direction as well as teachers shift in the blended learning classroom. And, um, couple comments in the chat room are worth repeating, I think. Bruce says, uh, can administrators cope with it emotionally that they're going to have to observe teachers in a different way? And, <laughs> and Catherine adds in here that, you know, that yeah. they, the administrators are going to have to look at the data as well, to look at the data and the assessments that was mentioned earlier to see how students are doing that way. Um, and, and perhaps, like uh, Mitch said, they'll be logging into uh -huh. Um, grade books to see the completion rate and that sort of thing, and that's what Susan added that in here as well. That that there's a whole different direction of uh, observing and that sort of thing. Or if you do walkthroughs in your schools, you know, what do you observe in five minutes in a blended learning classroom? You know, that's kind of a challenge for a lot of administrators. So, great thoughts there. Um, let me just throw out one other question here, and then we'll let our panelists kind of wrap up. Um, so. We've, we've touched on this a little bit throughout the conversation, but I'd, I'd love to hear your direct thoughts about how does blended teaching better personalize learning for students? And Mitch, why don't we start with you, and then Becky will go have you second, and then Dr. Goodwin can follow up and after she hears what everybody else has said. Well, one of the big advantages is just the timing of things. Um, I, 
you know, I, I kind of keep a minimum of where they need to be, but they can work ahead in the curriculum, and then if they know that uh, they've got something big next week, uh, they can get most of their work done ahead of time. Um, so they, it, it personalizes it that as far as their time. They can do it whenever they want. Um, and if they're having difficulties, you know, I'm still there to help them out. So um, I guess that, that's basically it. And I, I feel like it's, you know, that as, as Youth Connection continues to look more and more at skills, you know, and do they have the skill to read this and, and do that and then extend that learning out into the um, Internet. And uh, so I think a lot of things will become personalized. The, you know, the extension uh, for specific students would be about something they're interested in around that particular science or a topic or that particular literature or whatever it would be. And so the extension would be great. But it's also a wonderful way to differentiate so that I can now have groups of students who are struggling with the same problem. I think Mitch was mentioning that earlier. And, and I, I think both Becky and, and, and Mitch mentioned some very key things in terms of personalizing learning. Um, I mean, it, it really allows uh, teachers to be able to address students at their level and where they are. But it also allows students to take the responsibility for what it is they, they need to learn and how quickly they learn it. And so it really uh, gives the, the students a sense of responsibility and ownership in their own um, in their own progress. So I think you know what what both the panelists have mentioned is, is key in personalizing learning and things that teachers have to really think about when they go into a blended learning environment. So we've reached the end of our webinar. I'd love to have uh, Dr. Goodwin and then Becky and Mitch each to give any of your final thoughts about blended learning or some summary of, of what you'd like to leave everybody with. So uh, Dr. Goodwin, I'll let you finish that first, and then Becky and then Mitch. Um, well, you know what? I think Mitch said something very key um, during the conversation. He said, you know, he's creating this stuff as he goes along. You really have to be flexible enough to be able to do that because that's exactly what it is. We, you know, we are now looking for some people to come in and do professional development for us around blended learning, but what we are finding is they are not, um, they're not giving us the PDs that we need, so now we have to go in as a group and create the professional development to meet the needs of our teachers within our network. And so I think, you know, to wrap it up, being flexible, and being creative enough and, and being having the courage to, to create a blended learning environment is something that we really have to begin to embrace. And I concur with that and also that I feel like we're right at the beginning, this is our second year of looking at blended and, and we're adding things and thinking about it and it's really kind of exciting, you know, to see how the teachers are breaking out of the mold of stand and deliver at the front of the classroom and that kind of thing. And so it's kind of an exciting time to to help uh, teachers, you know, move toward not seeing themselves as a stereotypical teacher but, you know, really ha facilitating learning so that students are getting a lot more um, of what they want out of an ed education. <laughs> Mitch, did you have a final thought there? Yeah, okay, sorry, I was having a little trouble getting back on. Um, I just wanted to share one last thing, uh, one thing that I do through the online portion of the blended environment is um, in Schoology they've got a nice little area uh, called discussions and so I I just, I, it was kind of interesting, I did this last year and have continued it this year, I'll start a discussion and you know how you, if you have a traditional face-to-face discussion with the classroom, you, typically you'll get about four to six students that are really involved in the discussion with you. And you, you're trying, and it's like, you know, I've heard from you enough, I need to hear from somebody else. And it's hard to pull things out of kids. Well, in this discussion area, I'll pose a question, and I, I just make it nominal points, but uh, they have to, I have them make a point that,
it. So we'll watch either a video or um, I'll have a news article or some current event that uh, I want them to respond to. And they can respond positively or negatively. And everybody has to make a response. And then the next day, they have to go in and read everybody's responses, and they have to pick one response that they want to add to either agreement or disagreement. And since I've done that, I've, I've just been astounded by the, uh, by the feedback that I'm getting from these students. The kids that will sit in the back of a room and not make a peek sometimes will write multiple paragraphs and you have, in a traditional classroom, I think you have no idea how intelligent this kid is. But when they get, have the anonymity to really, um, they don't have to worry about what, you know, somebody's going to say to their face. Um, it's just been amazing, some of the discussion, by far the best discussions I've ever had. So I know that's kind of a part of the blended. It's more the online portion that I'm able to bring in and this and uh, I think it's just another one of the great aspects of making this flexible to meet the needs of any kid. Outstanding. Everybody, if you could join me, if you want to cl click on a smiley face or the applause button, thank you to uh, Mitch from Colorado, Becky, and Dr. Linda Goodwin from Chicago. We sure appreciate your insights. Hopefully, we'll get to see you on a future webinar with iNACAL, and I will be emailing the link to the recording of this um, out to everybody so that you can access and listen to it again and share it with others. Thanks everybody for being here and see you online soon. All right, thanks for having me.